Ready? Okay. All right, friends, we're going to start with just a minute um, or so of silence. If it feels good to you to close your eyes, that's great. If not, just a soft focus. And um, there's an invitation. I'm making an invitation if you choose to accept it to breathe during this time into your heart, whatever that means to you. Imagine that you can breathe into your heart space. Take a minute to do that. Amen. I'm Amy. I think I've met most of you. Um, our time together today is going to be like all collective practices, um, surprising to all of us. So sorry to ask how many images we'll look at. I put in a handful. We might only look at one. We'll see because we'll see what the group creates and decides. Can you hear me, Judy and Charlotte and Joe? Yes. 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 So I brought some beloved friends of mine and one brand new friend today mm -hmm. um, in these images. When I found out that Lori wanted to work with art as devotion, I got very excited. This is something that's very near to my heart. Um, I didn't always use art that way. I was an art historian. I was a professor of art history and archaeology as my first career. And um, at that time, I don't know how academia is since I am in, in a totally, not totally different, I'm in a different career now. Um, we talked about religious arts as though it were kind of a quaint vestige of the past. And so even if I had spiritual, uh, relationships with these objects, that's nothing I would have brought to certainly my professors and I would not have talked to my students about that. Um, they would sometimes give me little notes asking about their spirituality, which was kind of fun. Um, we're gonna work today or play today with some Flemish paintings from the 1400s and 1500s, mostly 1400s. I, in my early career, I was a graduate student working on my dissertation and then as often happens, I had many jobs. So I would spend my days working on my dissertation at the Library of Congress. If you've been there, you know it's an overwhelming place, um, visually, uh, spiritually. And I worked at the National Gallery. I also worked at a gallery, a small gallery in um, Baltimore called the Walters Art Gallery. And I taught wherever they would let me teach. And because I had done my master's in modern art history and my PhD in ancient archeology, span they would, you know, people who needed to hire people would say, oh, well, you can do everything in between, right? And so I said, sure, I'll do all of Western art, which it was great for me, I loved it. Um, but what I found was with these paintings in particular, when I had studied them in school, and we'll get into this a little bit later, we were taught and we taught a very intellectual way to look at these images. At the time when I was going to school and then teaching, we taught about something called hidden symbolism. And we used iconography. Lori introduced you to that word. And um, it has a couple of different meanings when we take it and make it English. It's not a Greek word, it's two Greek words. Um, iconography in the art history world, not in terms of making icons, writing icons like Lori does, but as a study is the study of symbolism. And so the works we'll be looking at, you'll see some of them will be so full of things that 
that could be symbols. And so we were taught to kind of take that apart. We were just, and that is so fun, of course. I mean, everybody likes to feel like a mystery and you can figure it out. Um, my heart eventually um, let all of that go because what I found myself doing was when I looked, worked at the National Gallery of Art, or when I was at the, the Library of Congress writing and being overwhelmed with all the books there and why in the world am I writing a book with all these books here, I would walk to the galleries and I would always find myself in front of a Flemish painting. And um, in a darkened room, usually they're dark because of uh, the need for, for conservation there. And I would just sit in front of these paintings. At the time I was no longer going to church and I was not talking about um, to anyone about my spirituality, but I found a place to hold my life and my struggles within these rooms in front of these images. So that's how I bring them to you today. Um, I have lots of information if you really get excited about some symbolism, we can talk about a lot of that. But I'd really love for us to just see how these images speak to us. So the, the sociological changes that are happening at the time of these images are, are vast and they really make a difference in the works we're gonna look at. So in the 1400s and 1500s, in the Low Countries, uh, that is modern day Belgium and Netherlands and Luxembourg. There started to be a lot of lay brotherhoods and sisterhoods. So no longer did you have to go and be separate yourself from your life to be part of brotherhood or sisterhood. You could be married, you could have children, you could have your own life. In India, it's called householding, but you could still be devoted and be in, um, be in community with others who did the same. This is also the time where people started to have their own prayer books. The first thing we'll look at is an image from a prayer book. And those prayer books were in Latin, but also usually in the vernacular. So that's radical. I mean, for us, it seems like a prayer book in the language that we speak right now, but it was radical for these people. So I want you to just keep that in mind as we look at these images that we're starting to have at least in ways we can understand hundreds of years later, images that are made for a personal devotional purpose. That's me. All right, we will start. Y'all can interrupt me at any time with questions. Um, do speak up so that those on the Zoom can hear you. It's fine with me, yeah. How do we do that? Which one? <laughs> All right, so this first image, this is my new friend. I wanted to, to bring something new to me too. Um, this is part of a tiny book of common prayer. The image you're looking at, the pages in this book are about four and a half by four inches. So do a little mental trick, right? To figure out how that would be to hold that in your hand. Um, this book is by um, the Master of the Privileges of Ghent and Flanders. We have a lot of things like that. It's easy to have the first one. We just um, made up. It was, we date, it is dated to 1440 through 45. It's in the Art Institute in Chicago. Um, and this is an image of the visitation. So you remember the story, uh, Mary's just heard that she's pregnant and she goes to see Elizabeth. So I'm not even gonna read the text. I want image, I want us to relate to the story through images. So we'll just take a couple moments and um, in quiet and just see what draws you, what captures your attention. And we'll share in just a few minutes.
Anyone willing to share what, what's arising for you when you meet this image? I think uh, the vivid blue that Mary wears is obviously striking. Uh, and you can see that Elizabeth is older. I like the background with the trees and then up on the top of the hillside there, the flowering <coughs> trees, which indicates a spring coming, a, a new life, a new a beautiful time. The, the carnival feeling around the entire thing in the day is really exciting because it's full of color and <laughs> and so I, I think the event is a presentation is very happy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's hard, it's hard to see from the back here. Yeah. Uh, and I was thinking of getting up and going there. And please do. Y'all, please, if you feel more comfortable going there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. They both do. I was kind of struck by the way the whole thing is asymmetric. Like there's a lot of uh, asymmetric, like things aren't synchronous. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot, nothing mm -hmm. synchronous until you get right to them. And then like right around them, like there's there's this cohesion. And like, to me, it like spoke to like the important thing was the connection. Like the the connection. connection between them, like they're almost one person. And it's just like, what's important here is this connection. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. Wait. I also like how the, the carnival is thrown over on the outside and makes the, the center so calm. Right. So you've got the busyness on the outside. Mm -hmm. I really like that. And I like that in conjunction with, with what Raven says that there's so much around, but it's relationship just between these two that it's almost, they look like one. The flowering trees I mentioned are not flowering trees at all. It's just Jerusalem in the background. It's Jerusalem. It is. I, it's a, uh, sort of. Yeah, let's. It's Jerusalem, but it's it's not right. Right. That looks much more like a Flemish city. city. Yeah, that's probably the holy Jerusalem to come. Don't you think? So. Mm. Heavenly Jerusalem on the hill. Interesting. And it's a devotional image. Yeah. So I here's one of those intellectual pieces that we used to talk about a lot. Um, I'm hoping things have changed. But you'll see in our images that they're all set in what was their contemporary world. And um, a lot of our historians used to say they just don't know what Jerusalem, lo Jerusalem looks like. I don't think so. I think as a devotional image to, to make this thing happen, this major event happen in my own landscape pulls me right in. Then it's part of my world too. It's still happening, right? The visitation is still happening. Could be happening to me, to someone I love, to someone. Yeah. Yeah. I'm struck by the blue um, sort of dripping down from the top and kind of, it's kind of like heaven come to earth. Uh, it's that thin space that Richard Moore talks about. Um, that kind of is what drew me in. I mean, they have everything pointing to that direction, but that blue really in some ways uh, makes it different than just having Pi run and there. There's a message in that. Uh huh. That's me. Can I take a minute to ask the Zoom people if you can all hear? Are you hearing this, everybody? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. It's a bit faint, but yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And so that, and what you're saying, Terry, reminds me this relates to. Felicia's sermon today to pay attention to what draws your attention, right? Yeah. That reminds me of the, the Limburg uh, works of, uh, in, in those books that right. they share or trade the, the rich hours. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was drawn to the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about those shoes. shoes. 
<laughs> what do you think about those? What kind of shoes are those? Can you they see? They were like dancing slippers. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were typical for the time shoes with pointy toes. Yeah. For which time? The time that's painted? Yeah. 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 First, killing spiders and stuff. <laughs> 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 yeah. so practical. Right. Probably not what Mary and Elizabeth would have worn, though, right? But Simone would wonder about the orange color. Where's the orange? Mary, what is that? The one she's holding? Yeah. I wondered that too. It looks like a little sack, doesn't it? It looks just like a piece of fabric. It's interesting. She's in blue, and that Mary is usually either in blue or red. Blue represents her as queen of heaven. So this is prefiguring what will happen. She's not queen of heaven yet. Um, and I, I'm i interested in, I was interested in that little piece of fabric too. Maybe it's a bird. Well, from back here, it looks like a baby doll. Yeah, I thought that too. <laughs> but no, she's down. Yeah. Well, what makes me, what is, what it speaks to me about is the um, lightness on the earth of the holy, that holy moment. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not they're not grounded or heavy or mm -hmm. they're they're sitting lightly mm -hmm. and gazing into each other's eyes. I love them. Or kissing cousins. <laughs> so is that a fence and a division? Trees. 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 No. Oh, oh, yeah. It's a forest, I guess. Yeah. But it could be a division, right? But visually, I think it marks them off for yeah. sure, I think. And you might notice that in some other ones too visual elements that kind of put us in. We're in this sacred space with, with them. Yeah. It also separates them from the New Jerusalem on the hill. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote this story. Like, it reminds me of one of those moments where you'd be like, every view is like now. And, like, even just to be able to see that paradise is just, you know, it's just, we're not there, but it's. And it's just yeah, extravagant all the time. Yeah. It was like one of those great, like I had experience of having one of those great moments. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. For me to think about Mary, to try to put myself in her shoes. She's young and she's just gotten this news. And I think the first thing we know she does is this, right? To go to her elder, I think for support, for sanctuary, for something. And I think I would feel exactly like that. Like, oh, it's gonna be okay. It might even be really beautiful and joyful. So it does feel like the image is speaks to that moment when you're being invited into the into the that spiritual space in time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you're saying, for example, that it all starts with the with the pregnancy of Mary. The service. Service the whole service of the world starts with Mary being pregnant. The way the mountains come down, or the mountains come down, yeah. how that hill comes down, it centers, it comes into them, which brings out obviously as a center and 
again, Mary at the center in her dark blue, where we can also see her subdued. <laughs> And this is the time just to orient us when Mary, Mary didn't play a large role in visual arts and visual Christian arts in the West, not Chinese, but in the West um, for several hundred years. But starting in the late Middle Ages, she appears more and more. And that's in, in true in theology too. She starts to be talked about a lot more and there's all sorts of political and historical reasons for that. But um, that's why I think one of the, the reasons that, that they might choose to highlight. And we don't know who commissioned this work, but I often think about that, especially with the little books, right? Like who would have held this and how would the artist have made it appropriate for that person and made it a really special object for them to interact with? Because it's not like us where I can go and pick off, you know, we can go on the internet and look at today, we could look at thousands of images, right? This might be the only book if you're super duper lucky this might be the only book you have. So how personal you can make it yourself after the artist has given has completed it. Okay, we will move on to a really large altarpiece, large compared to this. Hmm. Has anybody seen this work before? Really? It's in the cloisters in New York. Yeah. It's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. It's called the Maraud Altarpiece. It's um, attributed to the workshop of an artist named Robert Campen. Let me give you the um, dimensions. Just If you're like me and you want to be able to picture that, the middle panel is about 25 by 25 Eight. inches. So still, we're, we're not talking Renaissance, Italian Renaissance <laughs> stuff yet. Um, we'll see one large, large, but still a lot bigger than what we were just seeing. So 25 by 25. And um, the side panels are 25 by 10. It's a triptych. So there are lots and lots of triptychs at this time. They're usually closed all the, all the days of the week except Sunday. And so they're open on Sunday. I have never, I've seen this, a, a dozen times. I've never seen the outside and I've never seen a picture of the outside, which means I think it's not painted. Often they are, they are painted on the outside. Um, and there's some evidence that the middle panel was painted years before the side panel. So the side panels might have been commissioned later. Um, this is 1425, I think. 1427 to 32. So it's really, really packed with lots and lots of imagery. So I'll let you just take a few minutes to, to do as Terry did, just pay attention to what draws your attention. I, I just love this one. I have seen it in person, but to see the color in person uh, and to see your faces, which again, I don't think my glasses are very good, but when you actually see it, you can actually see the facial expressions. Uh, I think it's so moving and it's sort of the, the painting that reminds me of uh, that I always think of when you talk about the Annunciation. Me too. This is kind of your Annunciation. My Annunciation. <laughs> I think it might be mine too. The it color. Tell us the name, but I think it's the Annunciation. It is. It is. Yeah, so the middle panel is the Annunciation. just amazing because that's my yeah that's what draws you the color of the fabric right well not just the color but the the fold and the sheen and you know the way it lays and visually appears to flow um, it's just you feel like you could actually reach in and pick up the gown and handle it. Yep. yep. Is that restored? Mm -hmm. It is cleaned a lot. It hasn't been majorly restored. 
there's no media. It's been yeah, it's been cleaned a lot. Um, this is the beginning of oil painting. And so you can see they're really using oil painting to a lot of um, its, its fullness in that fabric, right? Yeah. So. And even in the two side panels, which are very different, um, you know, much more somber tone, both in the color tones, but just in the feeling of them, there's still that movement of the fabric. Yep. And the movement of the paper, which is still, I mean, it, then it would have been a rag paper right. or vellum. Still has that tactile appearance to it, and that draws you. I can yeah. feel it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Your hands. Yeah. yeah. Notice the headdress on the Very Muslim Afghan dress. Any idea why where those who those are? We I know who they are. I don't want to be. I don't want to be. Uh, those are donors. Yeah. So those are the people. The donors. The people who paid for the painting. Um, and we start to see them now, which is would have been. So in the Middle Ages, in a church, you might see donors, and often they're kind of um, disguised as characters in an image, right? But now it is, they're put next to, but really carefully, like you, you said, somber in terms of the colors, this, this, them in awe and they're worshiping, right? They're maybe witnessing the scene. I don't know, what do you think? Once I say that they're donors, what does that do yeah, for your The door is open into that room for them to see. But, but it's, it's congruous, incongruous on the other side. He's not a painter, he looks like a woodworker. I can't. They must have done it. Well, I think it's just. Oh, he did it still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's identified as still. Oh, really? Oh. I'm struck by the interior scene and the mm -hmm. severe perspective that she has. And a closing in on it. Focusing. Focusing, yeah, yeah. And you're going to be by the door. The door is as big as a building, like an awful big door in a very big size. The door on the left? Yeah. Well, and it, it doesn't, it's a wooden door um, that doesn't appear in the center panel. Mm -hmm. And look at the, so that's ground level on the left, right? They are on the ground. In the middle, it looks as though we're on an upper level right. because you look out of the cloud. But, you know, it's, it's almost like the left panel, they're getting a peek into right. what this is. Um, What's on the table in the main room? Is the book? It's not a, a vase of dead flowers. <laughs> it's not a dead flower. It's a lily. It's a lily. Mm -hmm. So on the table is a lily. There's a candle that's just gone out. Gone out. You can see this little smoke. Oh, yeah. And there's both a book and a scroll. All of these are symbols that people have identified. But what I'm interested in is what is what do we, what does anything mean to you when you look. Struck by the the ray of light in the center of her dress, like the light, yeah. the light beams coming out, and how she stood up, that would be her room. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Was there Joseph working in, in Bruges or wherever he is? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not Nazareth for sure. But she's also wearing blue and red on the royal palette. Yeah. 
one another prefiguring, I think that's a great idea. Oh, what's to come? Typically, where's the get it in? Are they? Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like this is the moment before she gets yeah. captured, before her attention is captured. So the candle has just gone out. Yeah, that's the part where she's thinking, oh no, this can't be not not right. me. <laughs> if I don't, if I just don't turn, right. if I don't look. Uh, oh. <laughs> Angel's like blowing her candle out. So she can't be. <laughs> I love the little homunculus there too. Yeah, can you point it out? Lori, can you? I don't know if you can make it big. Right there. What is it? It's a homunculus. It's a little tiny sprite with his cross oh, beaming in. A little sunbeam beaming right towards. <laughs> so does she get the attention she's going to get out of this? She's out of luck. Right. <laughs> Sadly mistaken. Say that word again, Dory. Homunculus. Homunculus. No, little. Little person. Little. And so, so what, is, what I get, I mean, my takeaway is again kind of like Felicia's sermon, looking for God in the, the little ways. I mean, this didn't turn out to be so little, but it comes to her to start with in this little thing. The loss of ordinary light and this little character flying towards her. If you ignore the angel, of course, which is kind of a big difference, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and there's some theologies that, that say that the incarnation has the, the exact moment when Gabriel speaks it, right? And so that's, we would be about ready. <laughs> be about ready to hear Gabriel's words and for her to feel differently. Yeah. Is there any significance? Which one the white the white towel or cloth is signifies her purity as does um, the lily, but I think the red so she often is shown in red, um, when there are scenes of the passion are related to the passion so that again is about Jesus' death so that's again saying her purity and and I also for me it's kind of like look what she'll go through. Yeah. Doesn't know that. <laughs> yeah. I love Gabriel's wings too on this one. They're so solid looking. They're like, um, they are like a bird, like a mm. ordinary bird. Mm. They seem yeah. real heavy to me. Over the angel is so much bigger. Mm -hmm. I'm struck with Joseph, how much older he is. Yeah. Was that typical of Fleming to come from? A lot of images have him older, quite a bit older. Yeah. Not all. Yeah. This one, I think, is the most. I, that's the one that always strikes me. Yeah. So it is, as, yeah. I think as a triptych, it's, it's almost disturbing to me that there's no balance there. That you know the, the the two daughters in worship and that makes sense, but then like Joseph in his workshop just sort of fit. You know I don't know why, but but you, I would think the triptych would would you know, balance on either side. So what does that do? So visually, it's alarming. A little, a little bit disturbing. Uh -huh. I, I like all the images, and, and I have a couple of really old triptychs as well at home. They, they balance the mm -hmm. into the center. This doesn't, I've never seen. But Joseph isn't affected by it. Exactly. Say more. Say more. It's just that Joseph isn't affected by it yet. So it's not, he's not born with it. So it's not a continuous scene, is what you're asking. 
And he just yeah. not show up, yeah. working along in your shop, minding his business. He, he just why he, he has he has no play in the game at this point. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> the other story is this story he doesn't have to play. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting that there are two books. She is reading one book and then it looks like there's a book on okay. training. Mm -hmm. So would that be the word? It's often said that that is, a, and then the scroll would be the Hebrew scripture. So, and the, the book on the table is on top of the Hebrew scriptures, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so you can get to, yeah, to create a new world. <clears throat> and what do you think about her sitting there reading that book? What is it? What kind of Mary is this? What do we, yeah, who is that? Be educated to read. Well, well with extra time, to, yeah. yeah. Time to you know, flow the flow of her mind. Right. You know, right. She's reading something other than the, the scroll. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm so tight. Yeah. <laughs> 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 a novel or Romance. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All the detail work in the room around her also shows the well. Mm -hmm. I like in Joseph's bookshop, you see how they hold the window open. There's no glass in it, it's a panel on top. And those interiors look much more like Northern Europe then. Mm -hmm. right? So again, I think not saying they had no idea what the Middle East looked like. No, this is putting this in my context so I can, so I can relate. And I think the donors for me do that too, right? Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have been the donor, but maybe I would be lucky to see that at the church. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe the donors are kind of my way in to be part of this witnessing. Look at the perspective in the middle panel. You know, it's, it's very realistic right up in here. And then look at what, what's happening here. Mm -hmm. What's happening there? It's like almost it's inverted. So that the colors become almost like there. Yeah, that's the perspective on the table. It makes it feel like it's to be forced. How does that how does that land for you, Kathleen? Does it what's the feeling you get in your body when you look at that? You want to fix it? I kind of want to make a fight. Right. So interesting. There to just get the attention. Like John said. Maybe it's to show what's on the table, not clearly. And yet, it's like she, like the painter put a, a perspective, but then put a table to an overhead almost because she wants all those things seen. And, and Joseph, we were talking about Joseph not being in the picture yet. He has no door looking in the room, right. he's not part of any yeah. of it, yeah. except that he has red. And he has a lot of symbolism there. So there's a mouse trap on the window ledge right there. And then there's another mouse trap on his table. And um, Jesus was talked about as the mouse trap for Satan that came oh. to catch Satan. So this symbolically pulls Joseph into that story. And then some people have read the piece of wood he's working on as prefiguring the cross. Prefiguring the cross. Oh. I just realized she is not sitting on the bench. No, she's on the she's she's on floor. The on, the floor. Arm on, the on the floor, but is she's she? On the kneeler, she's on the kneeler. On the kneeler. Yeah. What do you make of that, Missy? Um. Um. 
Well, she's sitting on both. Oh, she, yeah, she's sitting on I She's did. sitting on yeah, it. Like yeah, her arm is on the Yeah, her arm is on the Yeah, it's, it's a pew. Um, because I noticed the cross detail on the end. Yeah, yeah. And I realized that was a pew with a kneeler. And then I realized she's sitting awfully low, which is why the table looks really odd with her shoulder on a level with yeah. the table. And she's not paying any attention to the Not yet. Not yet. I think it's like that moment, the before and after when we have those chasm moments in our lives, right? And we're on the edge and we haven't quite seen. Uh oh, what's to come? Um, one interpretation of her being so low is her humility. She's close to. Um, I also think. Um, I think of when mourners say Kaddish, which, which would have been her tradition, you come and you sit on the floor. And so always, even in nativities and annunciations, we'll see evidence of the future mourning of Jesus. So that's just my own feeling. The detail on Gabriel's belt. Incredible. For me, it, it evokes the ordinary moment that is about to be transformed. Here she is doing her own thing, you know, not really, she's not in a devotional stance at all. She's just sleeping, mm -hmm. taking her ease. For me, that's Lori. I that's how I feel it too, and that's why the perspective works for me. It makes me uneasy. And just like two weeks ago, when we looked at the icons, and you know, with the pentocrator, the artist could have made the face symmetrical. They, you know, if you could do one side that way, you could do the other. There's a reason. This artist is playing with perspective, and we'll see a lot of perspective next yeah. or two weeks with Holly. Um, he could have done it how he wanted, you know, to make it look right. That's not what's going on here. And so for me, it is a kind of feeling of unease, just like before, like a quickening, right? Before like, oh, gee, life is normal. Life is as I know it. And then, then what will happen? Well, I'm just curious, you know, what Yes, and this is something that was debated. So when people started first, it was in the 30s and 40s and 50s that people really started working on the iconography. And they talked about hidden symbolism and they would say that they wouldn't. I don't believe that at all. Um, I think of it like us and how many symbols we have in our daily life that we don't have to deconstruct. We don't have to stop and think about what this symbol means. Um, they definitely would have known. Some, maybe there would have been a few hidden things that were erudite, you know, especially for the donors. Um, so that the, the fabric, this is, this is a time and a land <sighs> where there are a lot of textile merchants mm -hmm. and it's thought that perhaps that donor was one, right? So there are things like that that are, hey, bringing you in personally, but the typical symbols like Mary and the lily, the, um, the candle just being blown, being blown out means that the light, worldly light is no longer needed because we're about to have heavenly light into the world. All of that would have been just so much part of their, just their, um, their own understanding of the world and of the word for them. And this was in the different fabric, but then at home, not a church. They they allowed it to be 
in the church sometimes, usually the donors. And sometimes it was always in the church, just like a lot of donors now will buy a painting or commission a painting, but for a specific place. Um, this we think was in their chapel, in their home. It's probably in their home behind this mansion. And they're, they're in their own courtyard. Right, and there are some people who think that, um, you can see why it's endlessly fun, right? You can just, you can just, I have so much fun with making up the story. So that guard behind is an obviously um, really kind of a celebratory clothing. And so some people think that this was actually the donor panel and probably the Joseph panel was added up at the event of their marriage, which is a sweet thing to think of. Yeah. I want to just make sure that the perspective in just a second to say that in uh, the Eastern the Eastern Orthodox um, tradition, that perspective is going to be, that's that's what they do. So for me, it didn't even register as a, as a thing. It right. Was, it was uh, right. normal. Normal, but I think we, a lot of times in the West, we look through the eyes of the Italian world, right? Right, right which has a very elaborate system. Of, and the, in the in a few decades, these artists, the people who study with them will go to Italy to study and then they'll suddenly be transformed, right? But I think um, different ways of showing that we're in sacred space, you might not want it to look like a photographic, you know, like photographic realism. That lets us know we're on sacred ground. This is but the artist was really in tune to the perspective, if you look, Okay. Yeah. Look at the the panel behind the Joseph, but the, but his work table is is not at his out perspective, so you can see what's on the table. In the room where Mary is, it's generally in perspective except for the table, which is what we, they want to show what's on the table. We have time for one more, don't we? Yes, let's do one more. I know we'll do this one as a. Um... We'll do it as a Visio Divina. Does, some of you might be familiar with Lexio Divina. That's a sacred reading practice. With Visio Divina, we use an image. Um, and so, yeah, let's not give you any information. Is that okay? <clears throat> I will tell you it's a nativity scene. You can tell that. Um, I don't mean to be you know, secretive. I just want us to know these images. So let's take a moment of quiet and then I'll, I'll guide you through the next part. In Visio Divina, we, we use a visual image to be our prayer, to be in communion with our prayer. So now I would love you just popcorn style to say just one word at a time, one word. It might be a color, it might be a feeling you get, just one word. Crowded. Crowded. Mm -hmm. Frame. Hmm? Frame. Mm, frame. Massive. Massive. Like columns. Strange.
Good, and for the next round, again, popcorn style, we'll just share a phrase, a tiny phrase of what's drawing your attention. Try not to deconstruct it yet, just what's drawing your attention. Little people. Little people. Pairings. What's that? The pairing. Pairing. The pairing. Uh, the way they're grouped. The sweep of angel wings. Naked baby on the corner. <laughs> Trees on a hill. Trees. You are naked. Praying large compared to nature. <laughs> the triangle above. So taking that, whatever it was for you, that thing that drew your attention, really focusing on that and allowing God to speak to you in your current life through that one little detail. And if you're comfortable sharing just a little bit about that, you might be at the very beginning of, of that exploration. You might have more questions than answers at this point. That's appropriate. But anyone who's comfortable sharing, how is a detail speaking to you in this moment? I'm really drawn to the huge, big, huge, powerful figure. Great sight. Power with the recognition of Does that have a message for you? Yeah, because it's like the secular, like the idea of having more of that power is really important to why you have it. Hmm. And I saw the concert, I saw that naked baby, and still very vulnerable. And so I wanted to go on standing outside watching my belongings come through the window, face on the ground. Totally out of control of everything that's happening. And laying there, looking up. You know, it's kind of oddly shaped. You know, it seems like a long torso and short legs and a big head. And just incredibly vulnerable. You know, out of out of place. Mm -hmm. It's totally resonating. Don't know where you're going and, and what's going to happen. Right. Well, um, a little bit scared. But you can look back to then and remember. But still, you know, I have this much of my things, and everything else is in storage unit. And I'm in a temporary place. on somebody's couch. 
just that just really good. Yeah. No colors. I'm struck by the overall the the portico is all could be Roman cathedral got carvings it's beautiful stone it's got all this stuff on it, pillars and then yeah, and as somebody said inside in the in the stable there's half the roof is missing and it's in terrible condition it's open air if you walk through heaven to our lives. And, and, and the lines are kind of messy, but outside is really beautiful. When you, and when you die, we're going to walk through heaven, and hopefully, heaven will be on the other side. It won't be quite as messy as that. And then all this overrides a naked baby lying on the ground. Does he look like me or his mother? Or the other father? What does the other father look like? <laughs> the angel wings are all things of the people. Everybody just gets wet. The sweep of the angel wings are all heaven. I mean, from the tip coming down. Yeah, it's kind of like an arrow. I was going to say they're all pointing towards the horse. Yeah. Who's the horse? Right behind. Oh, oh, yeah. back, in, back in the shadows. Oh, the head, head up and to the left. Yeah, there's the horse back here. Yeah. Poor cow. But what that speaks to me of is that I don't have to worry that. that um, God is present and holy messengers are present. I don't have to do it all myself. Uh -huh. I like that. I do not like the little people. And that, that's disturbing. Why? Struck it how Nancy Joseph. Yeah, yeah. I, know. I know that. Could you tell us now about the thing? It's 11 32. I can tell you a few things. Yeah, um, it's in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. It's by a man named Petrus Christus. The 1450s, it is about 50 by 37 inches. Um, so a couple things. You want some of the symbolism? You want that or do you want to just? Okay. So um, oh, that's Adam and Eve. <laughs> that's Adam and Eve? Yeah, those figures. Yeah, Lori got it. And then all the images in Grazai, that's the word for that. Uh, gray colors. All the image around, around that archway are starting to the left glory that's um, the expulsion from Eden so Adam and Eve are being kicked out and then the next one is Adam is toiling the earth and then that's Cain and Abel giving their first fruits and then I think yes that's Cain playing Abel and then Cain getting kicked God sends him away. And then I can't remember. I can't see it. I think it's Cain. I'll have to look that up. Kind of a, yeah. It's Cain or Abel. It's either. What about the two figures of the Those, a lot of different interpretations have been made about them. Yeah, in those rondelles. They look more like medieval kind of. Figures. So, I mean, you can draw uh, your own conclusions about why we might have scenes of the fall 
right, in this image that is framing the nativity. Um, one thing that always strikes me about this image is that, again, this is the moment before. This is not, there's no shepherds there yet. The angels are with us. I mean, I know there's lots of angels, but um, have, has the shepherds not heard yet? Um, I love these. <laughs> They're like maybe looking, but it doesn't seem like they can see these two figures off to our right. Um, the angels, and this might be, I think, for those of you who are really struck, John is still shaking his head. They're wearing um, vestments, but none is wearing a chasuble. So the suggestion is, so they're being put in the place of, of presenting at mass, of, of presiding at mass, but none will actually do the mass. The idea is that Christ Jesus is the one, only one who will be able to do that as that little naked baby. The red and green figures in the middle. Who, the big one? That's Mary. No, the little one. Those are angels. Well, those are angels too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so oh, they have yeah. wings too. Yeah. Oh, see, we can't see that. So it's just yeah. angels. Angels. And big Joseph. These guys got the black ones. The angels are usually big. So the um, the scene of the fall like that um, is that painted or is that like a carved frame? It's that? painted. It's painted. It's painted. It's all part of the painting, right? So he's imagining that, and this is obviously he didn't really think that 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 the nativity happened there. Um, I should one little piece is that Saint Bridget is the first person who really talked about her scene of the nativity that looks like this that's out in um, the open. Um, if you've been to the Church of the Nativity, you know it's actually a grotto. It's actually a, in the earth. Um, so likely, if we're at the right place at all, when we name that place, um, did not look like the image we, we see. But again, if we, are, we, if we are imagining that we're present, to take our own imagery, to take our own symbolism, to make it real for us, I think is the most human thing to do. In the imagery in the Western church, we're totally different than the imagery of the Eastern yes. church. Yes, yes, for sure. Which, which used the grotto. Uh, right, as the word. right, right. Well, thank you, friends. I could, if you want, we have the slideshow I can um, if you get in touch with me, I can send it to you because there's a couple other images I think that we really want to talk about. Um, but thanks for sharing your your uh, feelings, your thoughts, your inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Charlotte. Charlotte or Joe? No, thank you very much. This has been fascinating and a good way to look at these paintings. Thank you. Thank you. And then the imagery on the on the bulletin this morning. I love it. Uh, it. It's so great. Uh, thank you for choosing that for it. Because it's just beautiful. Jesus and Peter really the next Thank you, Mila. And we will put it up as a uh, uh, video on our Zoom channel, and eventually it'll go on the website, so we'll be able to capture it then. Good. When we do it on the website, could we, meaning him, yeah. um, put links to the other images? Yes. Okay. That would be good. I can sure. put that whole slide to there. Okay. So thanks, Charlotte. See you the next week, I guess. Right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>